before we get started with our event today, I'm going to read through the Philly Liberation Center mission statement and code of conduct, and then we'll just jump in. So the Philly Liberation Center is a socialist community center for and by the working class and oppressed people of Philly. As an educational and organizing hub, we seek to bring together people to struggle around critical issues we face in our workplaces, schools, and neighborhoods, and build unity across historic lines of division at home and abroad. We believe that together, we can build power from the bottom up to fight for a society that meets the needs of our people. All right, so for our community norms and code of conduct, we have five here. First, we recognize the role that the police play in our society in protecting and serving the interests of the rich rather than the people. As a working class community center, the Philly Liberation Center does not work with police or allow police into our space. Members, former members, or people working to become members of any police organization, as well as past or present police informants, are excluded from participation in the Philly Liberation Center. So if that is you, please leave. <laughs> <laughs> the Philly Liberation Center fights for the full social, political, and economic equality of all oppressed people. Discrimination or harassment on the basis of race, ethnicity, gender, gender expression, sexual orientation, religion, or ability is prohibited in the Philly Liberation Center. Violations of this protocol will result in being asked to leave this space. Third, we approach all topics at the Philly Liberation Center through the perspective of unity, struggle, unity. We know that working class unity is essential to advance the goal of building a new society from the ground up, but we recognize the historic miseducation of the working class by the US schooling system, which has left us devoid of our history and divided on critical issues. We always begin from a place of unity and through dialogue and friendly debate, we aim to struggle together on these critical issues to build stronger unity amongst each other. Visitors who become hostile or refuse to engage in dialogue in good faith will be asked to leave the space. Fourth, the use of illegal substances, intoxicants, and smoking is prohibited inside of the Philly Liberation Center. So if you need to do any of those things, please do so somewhere else. Um, and the Philly Liberation Center is a space that belongs to the working class of Philly and is staffed completely by volunteers. We ask that all visitors respect the space and treat it as such. Please clean up after yourself and return materials to their uh, proper location. If you're unsure where something goes, you can ask me or another volunteer, Brian, Reyna, anyone else, ask us and we'll help you out. <laughs> All right, so with that, we're gonna get into our event. Welcome again, everyone. Um, hello, my name is Sarah. Thank you so much for coming to the event. Um, today, uh, we have Dr. Sadowski, who's going to do a presentation on a teaching on history of Gaza. Um, Dr. Kowski is an associate professor of history at Illinois University. I reached out to her about a month or so ago in the hall to talk to CSL, and um, she volunteered. She agreed to volunteer to present here. Thank you so much, Dr. Kowski. Um, I am a lecturer accustomed to projecting my voice. Do you need me to use this for this, or can I just speak without it? I think you're good without it. Everybody can hear her? Oh, yeah. Okay, great. If you can't hear me, you just let me know. Um, okay, so thank you so much for inviting me here today, Sarah. I am so grateful. I have been uh, organizing, teach. I've been teaching about uh, Israeli-Palestine conflict mm. <laughs> since 2004 when I arrived at Villanova. And I've been doing teachings specifically on Palestine and centering Palestinian voices since October 7th of this year. So my remarks today will place the war on Gaza mm -hmm. Language is so important um, in historical perspective. And the historical perspective is absolutely essential to understanding the current moment, which is not complicated. Mm -hmm. 
as you're told in the media, but which does require deeper historical knowledge. This did not begin on October 7th, right. okay? Um, so as I always tell my students, the past is never dead, it's not even past. Mm -hmm. right? Students often say, oh, we must learn history so it doesn't repeat itself. Mm -hmm. My approach is you must, the past is ever present in structuring contemporary relations. The past is never dead, it's not even past. Um, okay, so I have a lot to talk about. Um, I could spend a semester talking about this. If you want me to, whenever you want me to stop talking, just tell me. <laughs> I'm going to try, I don't know, 30, 40 minutes is what I'm kind of aiming for, but I'm also very in my teaching into call and response. So if you have a question, you want to say something, just jump in. I have no problem with that. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by emphasizing four themes that help us understand the creation of the State of Israel in 1948. And then I'm going to move to centering the history of Gaza since the Israeli occupation began in 1967. So those are the kind of two, those are the two, the way I'm chunking this out. Um, okay. So the first point, and, and, and I, I have a sense you all are a very informed audience. I should also add, this is very basic. I'm aiming it like at a ground level. So if I'm if I'm too low, I'm, I apologize for that. I'm just I'm assuming you you know nothing. I'm I'm going to be identifying key terms and and dates. Um, so the first point I want to make, which you probably are well aware of, is this is a conflict over land and history, not a conflict over religion. The second point that you need to understand when you want to understand the formation of the state of Israel is that it has historic roots in the history of Christian European anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is historically a Christian European problem. And it's that history that gives rise to my third point, which is the history of Zionism. Zionism, also known as Jewish nationalism, is a direct outgrowth of anti-Semitism. So anti-Semitism in Europe, which led many diasporic Jews to believe they would never be accepted on equal terms, give rise to this movement in the late 19th century that Jews need their own state. So two and three are interconnected. And we'll, we'll tease them out a little bit. And the first point, fourth point is that this is um, the, the foundation of the, uh, the, the creation of the state of Israel and what's happened since 1948 is related to the history of settler colonialism. And I'll talk about exactly what that means. Settler colonialism, in, settler colonialism is an ongoing project um, which seeks, which is also a genocidal project to the extent that it seeks the elimination of the natives. And of course, we know South Africa has brought the genocide case before the ICJ. So important. Okay, so to the first point about anti-Semitism, I should add, I'm a Jewish American woman. Um, I am not Palestinian. I have grown increasingly, un I'm invited to speak frequently and I'm very happy to do so. I'm also aware of the kind of centering of whiteness and the decentering of Palestinian voices. Of course, the problem is many Palestinians and Arab and Muslim scholars, due to widespread doxing, are afraid to speak publicly. So it's a paradoxical position that, that we are in. Um, so the first point about anti-Semitism, which has a history that's coterminous with the history of Christianity. Christian anti-Semitism is coterminous with Christianity, okay? Um, Jews in Europe, dating back at least for a millennium, um, have experienced widespread anti-Semitism. Um, this involves legal oppression and persecution, um, economic persecution. Jews were often forbidden from engaging in most economic uh, professions. They were they were forced to live after the 1550s in Europe, in walled in what were called ghettos. That is in fact the origin of the term ghetto in English. So this is an image of the uh, ghetto in Rome. This here is the gate that would be locked at night. So Jews were forced to live inside under lock and key from basically sun up to sundown. And there was a variety of 
reasons given for that. The Jews threatened the spiritual and physical safety of Christian Europeans, that they care carriers of disease, the, any number of different um, reasons for this anti-Semitism. Um, okay, so widespread anti-Semitism, exclusion, oppression, marginalization, marginalization of Jewish people in Europe gives rise to Jewish people across different parts of Europe that they will never be accepted on equal terms. Jews in Paris will always be seen as Jews first, French people second. Jews in England will always be seen as Jews first, English second, okay? This gave rise to this idea that Jews need a separate homeland. This claim was made during the rise of nationalism across Europe. The entire continent is being reorganized into, a, into nation states, France, Italy, Austria, the United Kingdom, okay? Um, so the, so Zionism, which is the movement for a Jewish homeland, has its roots in anti-Semitism in Europe, the rise of nationalism. This here is uh, Theodore Herzl, who wrote a famous book pamphlet in 1896 called The Jewish State, in which he articulated this need for a Jewish homeland. And I just give you like a little quote from it. He writes, you know, are we to get out now and where to? Palestine is our ever memorable historic home. The very name of Palestine would attract our people with a force of marvelous potency. I should add, Palestine was not the only place that Herzl and other Zionists considered. They considered Uganda, which at the time was being colonized by the British. They considered Argentina, another site of white settlement. So Palestine was not the fait accompli. It was not always to be Palestine. It could have been anywhere. And as, as Jamal Nasser posed to the British in the 1950s, why don't you, why don't you give the Jews Manchester City, right? If European and if, if Christian European anti-Semitism is the cause, why not give the Jews a part of Europe? Hmm. We know the answer to that, but it's food for thought, right? Um, so he says we should there, and this is very important. This is Herzl. We should there form a portion of a rampart of Europe against Asia, an outpost of civilization as opposed to barbarism. Here we see the beginnings of what Mahmoud Hamdani has called when victims become killers, right? Jews, the historical victims of anti-Semitism in Europe are now embracing this colonial language of civilization and barbarism. And they are presenting themselves as the sort of the, the outpost of Europe in Asia. And they did this very explicitly with the British, that, that, that they would be a trusted population that Christian, that Europeans could use to protect the Suez Canal and other European interests in the Middle East. So again, this brings us to the last, the, the last point, right? I made the points about the conflict over land, roots in the history of Christian European anti-Semitism, roots in the history of Zionism or Jewish nationalism, and the roots in the history of settler colonialism. So this is the very famous, am I going too fast? Or are we good? Good, you can hear me? Everything, okay. So this is the infamous Balfour Declaration, um, which was made between a member of the British House of Lords and um, the, the Zionists. I'm sure many of you have heard of this Balfour Declaration. I just wanted to put it up here, it's an important document. So here, Balfour, who's the British Foreign Secretary, writes to Lord Rothschild and says, I have much pleasure in conveying to you, blah, blah, blah. This is what he promises. His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine. So this is 1917. Uganda, Argentina, the other sites have been kind of pushed aside and now they're focusing on Palestine. Um, view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object. It being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. There's lots of problematic things going on in this document. One, the British people promising a homeland in the land where other people already live. This is the middle of World War I. Palestine at the time was under Ottoman rule. 
the, uh, the British and the French are sure they're going to beat the Ottomans, which they do. So they're making advanced promises on territories that are not theirs, never were theirs really. Um, I personally find it extremely problematic to refer to Palestinians as non-Jewish, mm -hmm. right? To refer to indigenous people in this negative way is just part of the settler colonial mindset of disappearing native peoples. Anyone else have thoughts or you wanna point something out in this document or I shall proceed. I'm gonna keep going. Okay. So indeed, after World War I ends, the League of Nations, which is the precursor to the United Nations, meets and begins to carve up territories of the Ottoman Empire now that the Ottomans have been disbanded. And as part of that, the British are given control over the former Ottoman territory of Palestine. And this allows the kind of um, enactment of Balfour's declaration in practice, right? He made a theoretical promise in the declaration. And then two years later, beginning in 1920, the British are gonna become the mandatory power in Palestine. A mandate is just reformulated language for colonialism. Okay, so what is settler colonialism? I said that I made my four points, conflict over land, roots in Christian European anti-Semitism roots in the history of Zionism, and roots in the history of settler colonialism. What is settler colonialism? Um, settler colonialism is one of many forms of colonization that comes to stay, as some scholars have put it. Right? Some places are colonized by Europeans and then they leave. India is an example. Others, they come to stay. That's settler colonialism. In any settler colony, there's usually two things going on. One, claims to land, because in order to stay, you need land to live on, and attempts to depossess indigenous people of the land, okay? So it's, it's a project of replacement, replacing one group of people, natives, with another, settlers. Yes, basic. Scholars have, at least for two decades, referred to settler colonialism as a form of genocide. Because it seeks the elimination of the native, it is inherently genocidal. Examples of white settler colonies include, of course, the United States, Canada, Australia, and Israel, we have to include, was founded under conditions of settler colonialism. British settler colonialism. The difference, the one interesting difference with the mandate of Palestine was the ways in which Jews were allowing themselves to be used as the settlers, right? In most settler colonies, it's white Europeans, it's Irish, it's who moved to the colony. In this context, it's this kind of, these outsiders within Jews in Europe who are going to become the settlers and who are then going to overthrow the colonial power of the British. So it's a little bit different in that way than your typical settler colonialism. So of course, this is an image of, of manifest destiny, right? Which is just, which kind of represents the settler colonial mindset. No, we don't like this image, right? <laughs> the, the, right there are no native people, it's empty land. And, and the Zionists, by the way, are famous for since the 19th century using this phrase that they want a land without people for a people without land. I'm sure you've heard that. Now it is true, we, it is true. The Jews in Europe are a people without land, right? In many parts of Western Europe, they cannot own property. But it is not true that Palestine was a land without people. That's right. Right, there was at least, at least six to 700,000 people living in mandate Palestine when this project began. Okay, much as we know, there are there are hundreds of thousands of Native Americans living in North America, even though they have been disappeared in this kind of white settler imagination. Yeah, okay. All right, so you find waves of Jewish immigration to the mandate of Palestine in the 1920s and 30s. You find increasing conflict between indigenous people and Jewish settlers. By the 1940s, in the middle of World War II, as Hitler's Holocaust is underway, 
settlers in Israel, Jewish terrorist groups begin attacking the British colonial administration. They want to enact their vision immediately. So they're attacking British kind of police stations and targeted assassinations of British colonial officers. So the British refer this problem to the UN. And the UN in November of 1947 votes to partition the mandate into two states. A Jewish state, by this point, Jewish people comprise 31% of the population of the mandate, and they are to be given 58% of the land. The thinking at the time was there would be more alias, there'd be more waves of Jewish immigration after the Holocaust. And the Arabs, who comprise 67% of the population, are going to be given 43% of the land. As you can well imagine, Arabs were not in support of this partition plan, which they were not party to, um, and which to them was, was illegal from it the moment it happened. Jerusalem was to remain um, an international zone. That gives, that's part one. Okay, are you with me? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't say, who was attacking the British people? Zionist uh, Jewish organizations like the Irgun and the Haganah are attacking the British in order to get rid of them and seize claim to Israel. It's sort of like, if you were to think in parallel, it's almost like, I've never thought about this out loud, but I'm doing it now. It's like the American Revolution, where the settlers become the revolutionaries. But they're not really, I mean, what kind of revolution are we talking about? Okay. Right? It's that. They want, they want to enact their project. And the British, by that point, are an obstacle. Because by 1937, the British begin to impose limits on Jewish immigration. And they don't want that. Why? Why are they imposing limits? They because it's causing people? tremendous conflict. Okay. You have tens of thousands of people coming over in an organized fashion, right? Indigenous people who are living there are not, right? This is pre-internet, pre, you know, pre-internet, you know, global news, whatever. People are living there. The Zionists of Europe have an organized plan. They have organized, they're organized politically, economically, socially. They're coming over, they're buying up land, and people in the region don't have the same vision, and they're not as well organized. And so there's increasing conflict between sort of people on the ground and these new immigrants who are coming over. And one way the British seek to alleviate that is to slow down the immigration. But they do this in 1937. Two years later, World War II breaks out. So it's one of those, we don't know what would have happened. Had there been no 1939, we don't know what might have happened. Okay. Other thoughts, questions? Yeah. So you had the group of like, a mix of Jewish, Christian, um, Muslim yes. people, native to the area living there. Yes. And then you start having Jewish people not native to the area moving in. Correct. And when about did that start? And were they primarily like an agricultural? They are. Community? This is a good question. So there have been Jews living in this region continuously. Mm -hmm. um, many of them are very religious Jews. These Zionists, like Herzl, are not religious Jews. They're secular Jews. They're seeking a nation state. Um, many religious Jews then and now are very opposed to Israel. They are very anti-Zionist, which brings us to another question which we can talk about is what is Zionism? What is anti-Zionism? What's the relationship between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism? And they are not the same, right? You can be a Christian Zionist as the majority of evangelical Christians in this country are. Mm -hmm. And that is an anti-Semitic position because Christian Zionists believe that the state of Israel is preparing the region for the return of Christ, after which Jews are gonna burn for eternity in hellfire. So I would call that anti-Semitic. Only <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> So that's that's so you can be you can be a you can be an anti-Semitic Zionist, you can yeah, be a Christian yeah. Zionist, yeah. you can be a Jewish Zionist, you can be a Jewish anti-Zionist. So the equation of anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism is extremely problematic. Yes. Okay. All right. 
So there's my part one. Okay, so. The UN votes for this partition plan under incredible pressure from Truman and um, US administrators, the plan, the plan passes. And on May 14th, 1948, the British depart the region and the region is plunged into war. Zionists implement a strategy of expulsion called Plan D. Plan D called for the quote, conquest and permanent occupation or leveling of Arab villages and towns. So this is the settler colonial mentality. It's an eliminationist mentality. Seize land, expel the people by any means necessary. Extinguish their lives, extinguish their presence, whichever. Oftentimes extinguishing their presence will lead to the extinguishment of lives. And there's a whole literature about the relationship to land as being more than just a kind of capitalist property, right? Right. It's about the spiritual relation. It's about natural resources. It's ancestry. It's memory. And so it's a very complex expulsion. The severing of people's relationship to land is very complex, has complex meanings. Um, so this so-called transfer of people um, was affected by the destruction of towns and villages and led to the creation of 750,000 Palestinian refugees. Here's Walid Khalidi uh, writing in 1992, by the end of the 1948 war, hundreds of entire Palestinian villages had not only been depopulated, but obliterated. Their houses blown up or bulldozed. In the vast majority of cases, all that remains is a scattering of stones and rubble across a forgotten landscape a lost world. Now, I don't know if all of you are looking at the contemporary images of Gaza, but that speaks directly to what we are seeing. Mm -hmm. Even though the Israeli forces have attempted to kill every journalist with a drone and make it impossible for us to see what we are seeing. Mm -hmm. Over 82 journalists killed so far in Gaza. Um, okay, so this is what the Palestinians refer to the Nakba. Nakba means catastrophe. The Israelis refer to this as the war of independence. <laughs> yes. Um, the war of independence led the state of Israel to occupy. Remember I showed you this slide where they are given 56% of the land. Through this policy of expulsion, after 1948, they expand to 77% of the land. What we see, and this is a fantastic website called Visualizing Palestine, I encourage you to look at it, it has maps and all kinds of interesting resources, is an expanding Israel and a shrinking Palestine. So here is 1918, right around the Balfour Declaration. Here is um, 47. So the blue is the Palestine, obviously, the black is Israel, 47 right, when the UN votes to partition, and as you can see, a shrinking Palestine and an expanding um, Israel. In 1967, when Israel conducts its six-day war, Israel expands to control and continues, currently controls 100% of the territory. So we're going from 0%, right, if you were to go 0%, this would be zero, right? Israel didn't exist. 56%, 77%, 100 I'm speaking in shorthand, but you understand. So Israel today controls 100% of the territory defined by the UN in 1948. Okay. Are we good? We're gonna keep going. Sorry, was, it, was there a, a website that you mentioned? Visualizing Palestine. Awesome. We just had a, a question in the the chat about that. Okay, great. Okay, so basic facts about Gaza. It's a very small strip of land, 25 miles by five miles wide. It's home to 2.2 million Palestinians. It has the second largest share of 
people aged zero to 14 in the world. It is one of the most densely populated regions of the world. 50% of people are under 18, right? And we know more than half of the people killed as of today. I, every day, every time I lecture about this, I have to do this, you know, I think we're at 30,000 deaths. Um, we're at 30,000 deaths. They're saying it's going to take one year to clear the rubble. 60% of the built environment destroyed. 85% of the people internally displaced. Displaced, excuse me, 500% their houses have been destroyed. There's nothing to return to. Netanyahu now saying what? We're never leaving. We want to pursue the voluntary migration of everybody. What does that mean, voluntary migration under these conditions? 60% of the people in Gaza before October 7th were already refugees because of what that expanding Israel shrinking Palestine. So there's a double displacement, not just double. I mean, I don't know if any of you watched Bissan, the very courageous young journalist who's been displaced seven times. Okay, so we're talking multiple displacements. 85% of people are internally displaced. You understand what I mean? The people are not originally from Gaza, they've been pushed into Gaza, and now they're being pushed further to the south, pushed into Egypt, voluntary migration. Um, for the first 20 years following the Nakba, the region of Gaza was occupied by Egypt. And since the 1967 war, the region has been continuously occupied by Israel. Um, Human Rights Watch has, since 2007, called Gaza the world's largest open air prison. But many people object to that language because a prison implies a trial and a sentencing. So the language some are using is concentration camp. But of course, that's condemned as anti-Semitic, but we can, because yeah. I, I think for, for some, that there's, there's a history within Holocaust studies of only allowing certain words to be used when we're referring to the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And that includes sometimes genocide itself. The only genocide is that genocide. Um, that includes the language of concentration camp. Um, okay, so since um, 2007, um, Israel has imposed a complete land, sea, and air blockade on Gaza, which is defined. The Israelis say that they don't occupy Gaza. It's, they, they withdrew in 2006, and they have no issue. They, it's not their problem. But all international human rights organizations claim that this is a continuing occupation. Um, there is no way in or out. Um, so it's, it's hard to imagine these people are self-governed. OK. So I just want to clarify language, OK? Sometimes, and this relates back to the question of settler colonialism. Right, some say, well, this isn't really settler colonialism. I mean, this is the, the only democracy in the Middle East, right? I have a colleague who said, well, she began to be worried about democracy in Israel in 2016. It's like, wait, what? <laughs> what? So, okay, what are the, so I said to her, what do you think occupied territories mean? What does that mean? So I'm, I want, I'm asking the question and I'll, I'll give you a kind of basic understanding of what that does mean. We already talked about the 67 war where Israel goes from 56% in 48, I mean to 47, 48, 77%, 67, 100. What happens to those other regions? What happens to West Bank, Gaza and East Jerusalem? Um, what happens under occupation is that everybody living in those regions is placed under military rule. Mm -hmm. There has been systematic expansion of Jewish settlements since this period. And I will talk to you about what are settlements. As Amnesty International reported in 2017, under occupation, quote, people's entire lives are effectively held hostage by Israel. Their land is confiscated. Their land is illegally occupied by settlers. Um, they're, they're subject to mass arrest, systematic discrimination, no due process. They're held in kind of like administrative detention. 
which many Palestinians refer to as being hostages. And you want to talk about hostages? What about all the people held without charges um, in these administration, in administrative det uh, detention centers? Um, Israel has confiscated Palestinian lands and destroyed homes to create its security infrastructure, which looks something like this. Um, this is the West Bank Wall, a 440 mile barrier wall that separates the West Bank from Israel. Yes. So at this point, building a wall, you need a lot of resources. Yes. For resources. And are these primarily coming now from external countries like the United States, UK, Germany, financially providing whatever Israel needs to do this work? So since World War II, Israel is the largest cumulative recipient of U.S. foreign aid. Israel is, according to the UN, one of the 20 richest countries in the world. Over 95% of U.S. funding goes to the defense industry. I don't actually know how the Israelis, if they, if this falls under the defense budget, which would have been funded by U.S. dollars. Um, that's a good question. Um, so this is the barrier wall. What, what is not shown here is, and I'm in this beautiful room with all of these uh, amazing people, the amazing ways in which Palestinians have turned this entire wall into art. Mm -hmm. It is beautiful. It is amazing. It is inspiring. Um, so they have, it's also horrific at the same time. Um, so Palestinians are subject to military checkpoints. They cannot pass in and out of uh, Israel freely. They cannot fly out of the airports. They have to pass through barbed wire. They have to travel on separate roads from settlers. There's all of these kind of like separations of which there are many is the, is the root cause of why people refer to this as an apartheid state, right? So in the occupied territories, Jewish settlers have one set, one type of license plate and Palestinians have another. So there's all kinds of marking out of difference between the settler and the native. Um, this is the wall that was built by the Israelis beginning, completed in 2021. It goes underground and above ground. It, it extends into the ocean. And this is what is providing the Israelis with security against people in Gaza. Okay, so what exactly are settlements? So again, I've heard some people say, well, Jewish settlements, yes, that means that, that, that Israel is a, is a kind of settler colonial state. But what I'm trying to suggest to you is that it has always been a settler colonial state from the beginning. Um, so this is just the latest manifestation of settler colonialism, okay? So this latest manifestation of settler colonialism involves sending Jewish settlers, many of whom are Americans, to occupy illegally, according to the Geneva Conventions, Palestinian lands. It is illegal, according to the Geneva Conventions, to settle, to send people to lands conquered in war. So every year the UN does this pointless exercise of condemning this, but not doing anything about it, okay? So um, this is accomplished by the seizure, seizure of property, the transfer of people, and the diversion of natural resources. And excuse me for the typo. So uh, geographers in, in the occupied territories have shown the ways in which the planning of these settlements is genocidal, putting settlers between Palestinian populations and water, for example. Mm -hmm. So there's all sorts of ways in which the, 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 the building of the settlements is meant to um, eliminate native life. As of 2023, there were over 700,000 Jewish Israeli soldier, uh, settlers in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. You might think of all Israelis, according to this talk, as settlers. But when I'm talking about these settlers, I'm talking about people in the occupied territories. And we already talked about what those are, so we're good. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yes. Do most settlers maintain dual citizenship, or do they relinquish their their primary? Citizenship? All all Jewish 
vote anywhere in the world have a right to return. I'm sure you've heard of that. So they all kind of have this opportunity. So they all they are they all have dual citizenship or or it is available to them. I don't know exactly does each what each individual person does, but it is this is obviously a one of these kind of um issues the Palestinians have pointed out that American Jews who have no history in the region have a right to return to lands that indigenous people do not. Mm -hmm. Um, until 2005, when Israel withdrew its settlements, there were 9,000 settlers in Gaza. It's hard to get ongoing data, but as of 2017, there was 100,000 plus hectares of land that had been appropriated. I don't even know what a hectare is, to be honest, but mm -hmm. please don't ask me that. <laughs> I don't know exactly what that is, but I, I'm thinking it's it's a lot more than an acre. Um, the building of settlements between 1967 and 2017 has involved the destruction of 50,000 Palestinian homes and buildings. Again, settler colonialism is a genocidal project that seeks the elimination of the native. Taking land, sending people, monopolizing resources. Is that a hand up? Yeah. yeah. Um, can you go into what the settlers leaving in 2005, 2006? I keep hearing people say like, we left. Yes. Why? 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 They left. Like they left because there was an election. We'll get to that. There was an election in two thousand and six, and Hamas won. And so after Hamas won, Israel quote unquote withdrew. <laughs> but what kind of withdrawal is it when you keep people confined? Mm -hmm. it, it got worse. I'll get into that. It got worse for people in Gaza, honestly, not because of Hamas rule, but because of what I'm in, I'm in about to get into. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, in 1967, uh, the IDF, or some people call IDF, Israeli Defense Forces, oftentimes referred to in progressive circles as IOF. Right, the Israeli offensive forces, it's not defensive at all, um, passed an order that bans most, if not all, political um, expression in the occupied OPT, occupied Palestinian territories. This includes all forms of nonviolent resistance, including participating in peaceful protests and vigils, holding, raising, or displaying the Palestinian flag, Printing and distributing material having quote unquote political significance, such as this beautiful poster, such as wearing clothes with the Palestinian flag's colors, such as painting people wearing clothes with the Palestinian flag's color, verbal support for so called hostile organizations is prohibited. This meeting would be prohibited. Gatherings of 10 or more people for a political purpose, widely defined. The breach of this order is punishable by a 10-year prison sentence and or a fine. The Israeli government has systematically sought to ban and censor Arabic language school books and Arabic language press. And of course now systematically eliminate <laughs> Arab news and journalists entirely. In 2009, all references to Nakba were banned from textbooks for Palestinian children. Okay, so the erasure of a people's history. In 2011, the Knesset, the Israeli Knesset, passed what was called the Nakba law, which prohibited commemoration of Nakba, period. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about Israeli's occupation of Gaza for the first 20 years. Um, Israelis, the Israeli occupation of Gaza for the first 20 years suffocated industry, investment, infrastructure, and people's ordinary people's livelihoods. Um, there are so many examples of this. Um, in 1967, after the Six-Day War, the Israeli government closed and froze the assets of the Bank of Palestine in Gaza. Fifteen years later, 12 years later, they allowed the bank to reopen only if it removed the word Palestine from its name. <laughs> so in 
So the limits on banking have limited all kinds of economic opportunities, small business to large infrastructure projects. Permits are required to conduct business involving land or property, which perversely means when the Israelis bomb a building and people want to rebuild, they have to get a permit, which of course is not given or is not given in a timely manner. Okay, so this has led to state driven underdevelopment, right? If you see images of Israel next to images of Gaza, it's just the differences in levels of basic infrastructure are extraordinary. And that is a policy decision. Um, all different types of import export policies, limits on farming and food production have, or in this early period, incentivized people in Gaza to work in Israel. So I'm going to come to this point of like, what are we talking about 2006? What happened? So in this early period of occupation, when Gazans were permitted to travel to and from Israel, which they did under this economic pressure, um, things looked a bit differently. On the one hand, Gaza became increasingly dependent on Israel. But on the other hand, at least there was somewhere to go for work. Okay, the sealing off of Gaza took even that away. Okay, it led to skyrocketing issues of famine and underemployment. And at this point, the entire population facing starvation. Okay, I have like five minutes. Yeah, not right. We can... We can go to like 215. Yeah, Where are we now? I think that's good. We're at, at it's almost three. Okay. All right. So the the Intifada, something I'm sure you've heard of. Yes? Mm -hmm. yeah. Something which it looks like most people in this room did not live through the first time. <laughs> um, Intifada, meaning the shaking off. So in the lead up to the Intifada, which began in 1987, you saw increasing protests. Now remember what we said about that IDF order. Any type of protest is very risky for people, right? Risk is 10 years in prison and or a fine. Um, so in the year leading up to the Intifada, there was over 3,000 documented protests suggesting increasing unrest. Um, the underlying causes of the Intifada were related to these economic issues Workers traveling to Israel facing employment discrimination, withholding of wages, harassment at checkpoints, um, high unemployment. Okay, so there's there's underlying economic issues causing this first intifada in 1987. Prior to the intifada, there was polling data that again speaks to the widespread oppression of, of Palestinian people. So in this poll, which was uh, administered in 1986, they found that the majority of Palestinians and their family members had experienced arrest, beating, physical abuse, and threats by the government, harassment at military checkpoints, property or land confiscation, curfews and travel bans, demolition of homes, only 6.3% of people polled had experienced none of the above. Okay, so are we surprised that there is a mass uprising? There is no avenue open for political protest and there's widespread oppression of every form, social, political, economic. So in the first Intifada, which began in 1987, which was immediately caused by um, a truck which struck four people at a checkpoint in Gaza. But the immediate cause, I'm trying to suggest, there was already widespread, it was brewing, right? It's been brewing for decades, right? Um, in the year, you know, there's, a, there's an escalation. So what happened during the first intifada was mostly nonviolent um, uprising involving strikes, protests, riots, boycotts, and most famously, children throwing stones such as these two. They became the symbol of the Intifada. Mm -hmm. Children throwing stones at tanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Edward Said, one of the great 20th century intellectuals was photographed at the time throwing a uh, stone at a tank and, and experienced widespread um, doxing. Um, so Following the Intifada, or during the Intifada, Palestinians found themselves subject to mass arrest torture, violence, death, 
right? Targeted assassination, 1,200 Palestinians killed, 160 Israelis killed. There's a long-standing policy of disproportionality, which we can talk about, which many people have been asking about since October 7th. How many Palestinians must be killed to avenge the loss of Israeli life? There's a policy, right? Under international law, there's laws of proportionality. But under Israeli law, there's a policy of disproportionality. So how many Palestinians? Right? It's 30,000 now, and 1,000 Israelis killed on October 7th. Um, we saw during this period a new period, a new policy of lockdowns and closures. So I visited the West Bay in 2010, and I'm I was on a group with I was on a, a, a trip with many American professors, and we learned just the, the this kind of unthinkable, like you would never imagine these disruptions of ordinary life. Professors in the West Bank couldn't have a regular course syllabus because they never knew when there was going to be a closure. And students from the neighboring town couldn't come to class. So even something as simple as running a university class became like impossible. Okay, so there's this new policy of closures and shutdowns, lockdowns, excuse me, which also correlates to a massive expansion of the prison population in, in Israel. The Israeli army during this period conducted extrajudicial assassinations. Um, they were uh, encouraged to break the bones of young Palestinians. Again, the children became the face of the movement and especially to break their legs so that they could not run and their hands so that they could not throw stones. This is a theme. Sometimes the Israeli forces shoot to kill and other times they shoot to maim. And we've seen in Gaza, a lot of not only shoot to kill, but shoot to maim and the, and the rise of amputees. Um, quick thing on the origin of Hamas. So Hamas was initially founded by Sheikh Yassin in the 1970s as an out, sort of an outpost of the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood, which is really a charity organization. Um, Hamas is initially not a political movement or a political organization. Um, they're really involved in social expansion of social services, right? In the you know in this absence in this vacuum, right, where Israel is not providing social services in the occupied territories. Um, up until 1987, Hamas. I mean, uh, uh, they are the Hamas is is encouraging nonviolent resistance. Of course, things change during the first intifada. We hear a lot about the Hamas covenant from 1988. Um, I'm sure you've heard about that covenant, right? Which is seen as um, anti-Semitic. Um, the most widely cited um, section of that charter reads, there is no solution to the Palestinian problem except by jihad. The initiatives, proposals, and international conferences are but a waste of time. So many people refer to the 1988 covenant and say, Hamas, they don't work with anybody. They're genocidal. They're the genocidal ones. They're the anti-Semitic ones. But um, in 2017, there's many examples, and obviously I don't have time to go through them all, but there's many examples of Hamas attempts to negotiate a changing political platform. Like all political parties have changing political platforms, but of course, Palestinians are routinely denied history, including an evolving political agenda. So here is the 2017 Hamas principles and policies, which rejects persecution of any human being or the undermining of his or her rights on nationalist, religious, or sectarian grounds. And in 2017, Hamas accepts the Palestinian state as separate from Israel, meaning accepting a two-state solution. They also distinguish Judaism from Zionism. That's a very important shift. We're almost at the end. Don't worry. Are you with me still? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. During the 1990s, Hamas begins to embrace the use of violence for revolutionary purposes. Um, and they begin to carry out attacks specifically on Israeli buses and cafes. 
Um, they claim that their attacks are all retaliatory, right? And that they're seeking national liberation, which by the way, is legal under international law. Colonized populations under international law are permitted to use violence in pursuit of liberation from occupied forces. There are many Muslims, nonetheless, around the world and in Palestine who are against the use of violence, I should add. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't want any easy equations between Muslims support violence or there's, there's all I'm saying is under international law, colonized populations are permitted the use of violence to free themselves from occupation. Here's an image of the wreckage of a bus caused by a Hamas bomb in February of 1996. Hamas, I should say also, I didn't mention this, was operating, have you heard of the Oslo Accords of 1993? Mm -hmm. So after the first intifada, President Clinton brokers this agreement between the Israelis and um, the PLO with Yasser Arafat. Hamas does not acknowledge that agreement. Hamas does not accept the authority of Yasser Arafat, who's widely seen by Palestinians as corrupt by that time period. Um, there was also extraordinary violence during these this peaceful time of, of, of Oslo, of the Oslo Accords. Mm -hmm. Israeli kind of acts of violence against Palestinian people, right? So here's just a small um, example of them. Sweeping closures in 1993, the beginning of the building of the fence around Gaza in 1994, um, the economy of Gaza in 1996 severed from the West Bank, right? So Gaza is becoming increasingly marginalized. Um, the bombing of Gaza beginning in 2000. Again, these are all providing context for the way Hamas is operating. So in 2000, we see the beginning of the second intifada. The second intifada, the second shaking off occurs with discontent around Oslo. Os the Oslo Accords were meant to provide a pathway to a two-state solution. Mm -hmm. The problem is that pathway always favored Israeli security at the expense of Palestinian life. And it therefore never had widespread support amongst Palestinian people, particularly those in Gaza. Um, Israel's occupation um, after Oslo made life in Gaza even more um, difficult. In 2000, Ariel Sharon, who was then the Prime Minister of Israel, made a visit to one of the holy sites for many Muslims, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, and he brought with him 1,000 Israeli um, police and soldiers. This triggered nonviolent protests, to which the Israelis responded with rubber bullets and tear gas. This was the beginning of the second intifada, sometimes referred to as the Al-Aqsa Intifada. During this escalation of violence, again, Israeli forces, tar forces targeted Palestinian children, demolished homes, destroyed agricultural land, uprooted trees. I'm sure many of you have heard of the concept of ecocide being used to describe and define how Israel treats um, Palestinian lands. Um, this is, again, another one of these iconic images of a child throwing a, a, a rock in a tank, right? The unbelievable lack of parity between these two sides in every way. During the second intifada, 3,000 Palestinians were killed alongside 1,000 Israelis. In 2006, Hamas uh, stood for elections and won. Um, before 2006, Hamas had refused to acknowledge the Oslo Accords, had refused to participate in any national elections because they kind of thought these were all just sort of a setup. In 2006, they agreed to participate um, and they win. After they win, right, this is Hamas by this point is seen as an international terrorist organization condemned by the US. The Israeli government withdraws, withdraws all of its um, settlers and imposes a blockade. The blockade has led, which cut off. Now Gazans are trapped, right? When we talked earlier about the squeezed economy, at least people could move. Now they cannot move. This is that concentration camp, that open air prison. 
people cannot move in and out. They cannot visit their family in other parts of, of, of Palestine. Um, they cannot, you know, professionals, artists, athletes, nobody can move. There's people, people born in, in Gaza after 2007, many of them have never left, never left. Um, so these unbelievable restriction of movement placed on people and goods. Um, in 2022, people were virtually locked in. They are still locked in. Now they are locked in under bombardment. I mean, it is unimaginable. It was unimaginable. That's the point. It was already unimaginable. Palestinian workers are not allowed to travel to Israel. So again, that one opportunity is now cut. So there has been widespread economic devastation, 80% of people in poverty, 60% of people. This was before October 7th, in need of humanitarian aid. Now I believe it's 100%, right? Currently, 0% of children in schools, zero functioning hospitals, zero functioning universities. Um, this was before October 7th, 80% of households dependent on food aid. People have been subjected to what we call slow violence, right? So the numbers you see in the media, 30,000 killed does not account for the slow violence, the violence of starvation, disease, death from diarrhea, lack of access to water. So the numbers of the deaths from slow violence cannot be tallied, have not been tallied. Okay, the systematic limitations on electricity, water, fuel, food, everything are causing this slow violence. Children in Gaza experience like unprecedented levels of suicidal thoughts, mental health issues, and obviously physical health issues. And now we've seen the number of children killed or children with no surviving family members. I mean, we don't know the long term impacts. So international human rights organizations have long called the blockade a form of collective punishment, right? Hamas won, all of you are gonna pay. You've, you've heard this from Israeli officials today. There are no innocent Palestinians. There are no innocent Palestinians is the view of many Israeli officials. Israelis have pursued a policy since 2008 of mowing the lawn meaning they withdrew in 2006, but they periodically mow the lawn, cut the grass. You know what that means? Mm -hmm. Severe periodic military assaults. This is in pursuit of what's called the Dahia Doctrine, which was established in 20 2008, the use of disproportionate force to cause immense damage and destruction to extinguish hope in the minds and hearts of Palestinians, which will never be extinguished as we have all seen. This is what you need to understand to understand October 7th, 2023. Thank you very much. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. So welcome. All right. These are my, these are my, human, oh, my, yeah. my human rights report. Sometimes I come with books, but <laughs> you got to bring your receipt. Yeah. Your <laughs> that's right. That's right. We have, and that's the thing. One thing that really strikes me about all that's been going on is just the receipt. Like there is a plethora of information of Israelis themselves, like in the South in the South Africa, the case brought to oh, the yeah. ICJ by South Africa, there's just so much evidence of Israeli top officials from every single level of the Israeli state fully embracing, shouting with glee their genocidal intent. Mm -hmm. And like videos, like there's just so much evidence mm -hmm. <laughs> that really it completely just shows how this is a genocide. It's not a conflict. This is totally one-sided. And one thing that um, we definitely want to emphasize today in the rest of our conversation is how is the role of the United States mm -hmm. and in propping up and British colonialism, the British, but 
particularly the United States, because that's where we are. And this is the government that is taking our tax dollars. And instead of fixing the potholes mm -hmm. or, you know, throwing salt on the streets or making sure that SEPTA drivers are paid well and are safe and, you know, propping up unions and supporting our healthcare workers and supporting our teachers, instead of doing any of that, the United States government decides to use our tax dollars to fund genocide mm -hmm. and to fund the police force that acts in the same way towards working class people in this country. Mm -hmm. So with all of that being said, I think the inspiration that we can draw from revolutionaries, from Palestinians who are fighting against what appears to be, you know, this one of the richest countries in the world, one of the most developed militaries, but completely fell under the weight of the people's movement when people got together and decided we're not going to take this anymore. And so today, you know, it's been over three months of organizing, of in more intense bombardment specifically, and of the response to that genocide that Israel is enacting and committing uh, on Hazza. So we want to talk today about like why have we been outside in the streets mm -hmm. and, and ground ourselves in what does it mean to mobilize? Why are you mobilizing? What does that do for the movement? Um, and beyond that, what else do we need to do? Like how are we going to do our part in making sure that the United States stops funding this genocide. Because we're not, I mean, we're not going to stop until the United States stops funding genocide. Is, is that right? Are y'all ready to fight? That's yeah. right. Yeah? Yeah? All right. All right. Great. So for the next part of this conversation, we are going to take some time and read through the statement that was cr crafted by the Palestinian youth movement. And then we're going to watch a video from Breakthrough News about the impact of mass mobilizations on our highest you know, officials and government in the government. So for this part, we're going to do sort of like a people can just raise your hands or jump in to read the slide. And there's about like 10 slides, maybe. Um, and the full statement is posted on Instagram. We're we able to put it in the chat. Yes, I sent that in the chat. Awesome. So the folks on chat. Here. Yeah, also have access to that. All right. So who wants to kick us off? Yes, not to them. Can you read this one? You read the next one too. We mobilize to win. Rebellion and resistance are the source of strength of the Palestinian individual and Palestinian society. Okay. Mobilizations bring masses of people who may otherwise be disenfranchised, demobilized, alienated, or unorganized into politics. It is the first step many take for direct involvement in grassroots action and their first exposure to revolutionary politics. Okay, next slide. Yes. Mass mobilization is not revolution. Freedom and of itself of a necessary component of revolution as revolutionary action and the development of a revolutionary project. Next slide. Organized actions serve as an important meeting point between unorganized communities and organizations. They create a space where community members can directly engage in the fight for liberation and a tangible way that strengthens our collective struggle. Together, we can channel feelings of anger, disempowerment, and deep love for our people into a worldview that stresses the need for mass action. Building collective consciousness within individuals that expands the capacity for organizations to escalate on multiple fronts. Yeah. Uh, mass mobilization is to preserve the steadfastness and political cohesion of Palestinian communities in the face of psychological war on Palestinian resilience. They do so by politically activating Palestinian communities wherever we are and increasing mass uh, global support for our struggle. Mobilizations have a material impact on the economy through the disruption of business as usual education of the role of different industries and companies and the necessary deployment of state resources and institutions to suppress our movement. Okay. Mm -hmm. sure. Through collective action, our movements are able to communicate our politics and message widely, demonstrating to both our supporters and enemies our strength and our ability to directly confront the institutions that support Zionism and the genocide of our people. All right, so before we discuss, we're going to watch two videos. 
Uh, two clips from this breakthrough news interview with a Biden staffer. So yeah, let's see. Let's see. Oh, Jesse, we don't have sound. Oh, really? <laughs> Let's see. Hold on. Sorry. Why the administration has been under an enormous amount of pressure to push Israel to his mass for Gaza. Towards the system have been falling by an everywhere. As a tolerant who had confidence in his name, even his personal residence. And now within the administration. Tonight, we're talking to an anonymous Biden staffer who's one of the main organizers calling for the Biden administration to end Israel's massacre of Gaza. Yeah, we're going to have one more clip, a shorter clip from this, and then we'll discuss. For the protests working in the civil administration, the media told that you know what we do, what you do. The protests are going to sit down with the protests and going to work on the city to be involved in 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 the city. I just want to ask how many people here have been to a demonstration or a protest or an event? Everybody should raise your hands because, yeah, we all outside. So, all right, that's great. We have plenty of experience to draw from in this room. And, Ryan, should we switch? Yes. Okay, cool. I'm going to just leave these slides up here. Awesome. So, uh, just to get some initial reactions to the uh, to the big breakthrough news video, uh, does anybody have anything off the uh, off the top of their head that that uh, those videos that those clips uh, brought to mind? Yeah. Um, getting into spaces that are normally so untouched by any of like the working class struggle in the United States, like 
people who work directly for Biden. Um, I think it's so easy sometimes to turn a blind eye, um, but it really does show the persistence and like the consistency of just being out there every day um, pushing that it's like, it's really bleeding into even people's consciousness who have been historically very shut off to seeing any struggle. Absolutely. Yeah, no, thank you. What I think is fascinating is that those who condemn genocide need to remain anonymous. Mm -hmm. And those who support genocide mm -hmm. speak openly. Right. I mean, the, the fact that this man is not is anonymous and, and have in that is it's a it's a world upside down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of a lot of us have even experienced that in our in our own personal lives, mm -hmm. whether it be like with family mm -hmm. or you know, it's like it's all it always seems to be the the voices for peace that are like, no, you gotta, you know, you gotta be quiet, you gotta not ruffle any feathers, you have to consider other perspectives, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, not I was just thinking it's got to be so bad for people who already work for Biden to be like mm. protecting because we he already showed his commitment mm. to this whole ethnic plan. Like, wasn't it 2021 during the bombing that he was at some like UAW event and he got questioned about his support for Israel and he like joked that he was going to run the person over with the score of truck or whatever? Mm -hmm. I mean, people were working for Biden then mm -hmm. and people were working for Biden knowing that he said. In the 80s, like mm -hmm. we would invent Israel if it didn't exist. Mm -hmm. um, so you, it's got to be so bad mm -hmm. for people who work for this horrible Zionist administration, which would have been the case no matter who won. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Like, yeah. for them to be jumping ship, it, yeah. it's just wild to me. Absolutely. And so, uh, and yeah, like what, what do we think is like the connection between? Staffers in the Biden administration starting to raise their voices of dissent. And all of us being out in the street and mobilizing, like what what is the what is the bridge there? How what how does one affect the other? So yeah, I think that's a very much a, a reminder and keeping it a center in their minds. Or as like in the society, it's very easy to ignore um, atrocities that your country is committing and to separate your country from those atrocities. Especially due to the fact that with not only Israel, but with other countries, we just pay other people to do our dirty work. So it looks like we're not doing it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really easy to turn a blind eye and to not pay attention to those policies. Um, but when you have people literally starving themselves in front of your political buildings going like, yeah, this is so evil that I'm not going to eat until you do something about it. And I'm going to sit here until I'm hospitalized until you do something about it just to show you how disgusted I am with this. It really makes people question whether they're uh, good people or not, and that's where they might start to like confront some of these things. Is when they question, oh, now that I feel like I'm a terrible person, I might want to care about these things a little bit more and look into them. Just because the language that's used around it and the ways that we hide it make people not care or pay attention to it. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, I think just to add to that, it's like we need. All of us are different uh, lives. We all uh, hold different truths and lived experiences. But no matter where we're at, we all bring in the information and empowerment for collective consciousness. So it's like no matter where you are on your journeys, if you can speak to it, whether you were provided or you've been like a radical your whole life, like everyone speaking in the same direction is very important irregardless of like their perfected ability to do so or like what they've actually done. Even though yes, we want demonstration and embodiment, it's like all these different people are being affected by what's happening and they all have different levels of understanding. So even if it's not like a perfect way to say this is wrong, they're saying this is wrong and they're fighting it in their own way, in their own body. So it's like really a liberating thing to witness people that you're like, you don't talk about this kind of stuff, and they're talking about it. Like it brings more people into that consciousness of like, it's okay. Like you may not have the perfect way to share your radical revolutionary thoughts. Maybe you need to learn more, but everyone is a human being and lives on this planet. And they're taking a look around and they're like, I'm gonna say something about this. And that's very powerful, irregardless of what it looks like to people. Like we need more people talking about it, 
normalizing and humanizing the fact that we want to be free. And that includes other people being free. So I think it's really cool. I don't know if I'm going to hang out with that fighting person that person is. <laughs> like, he might not be like the person I hang out with, but I'm like, hey, thanks for saying that. Yeah. I appreciate that. Absolutely, MD. Which then is the segue to me of like, if that guy wasn't in that position or keeping that position, we wouldn't have that voice. And so those individuals there then have to ask themselves, do I do more harm or less harm by staying the vote? Mm -hmm. And is there a harm reductionist perspective for some of the people that work there that are like, well, this is insider intel. And if I just blend in with the surroundings, maybe I'll pick up on something. Or maybe I can reduce the fervor amongst people I work with. And that can form a collective movement from the inside. Like, I think sometimes there's like, it was the song there from Hamilton, you can't put a fire out from inside the house. But sometimes you have to be inside the house to put the fucking fire out. Like, that's where the fire is. I'm inside my family. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Like, my family is down for this, but I'm in it. I'm right. one of them. Right. right. And if the source is burning inside, you can get the source to burn. So I don't know. I don't know. Emily? Brian, to come back to your initial question, I think there's I've been a part of conversations before where like what's the connection between this staffer and like our protest in Philly? Like how do those two things connect? I've been a part of conversations where other people have used this language of like to universalize the understanding. This even comes to Dr. Polsky's comment of how just like to make it so universally understood that what's going on is disgusting. Right. And there's like this by more people participating, by us gathering people together in Philadelphia, it's all part of this wave of mass consciousness of just understanding how truly disgusting what's going on is. And that I feel like that shift in collective consciousness that you're even pointing to plus is like it's all part of this collective shift in understanding. And so that. I don't know. I I love that language that people have used of like it should be. I should be so comfortable being like this is disgusting. Yeah. And the fact that I can't say that in a lot of spaces without fear of retaliation, that's the problem, right? right? And so like that's how that's how I see our like local organizing being connected to like people who actually are closer to the people in power. Absolutely. Uh, I actually want to move on for a sec. I'm not sure anybody had any any last points they wanted to make. On that, on that question. We sure? Okay, cool. So, uh, yeah, I wanted to move on to talking a little bit about our, our own personal experiences and like the, the people in this room. Um, I'm curious, like, what are some actions uh, that you've either participated in or that you've seen that have been uh, in support of Palestine in uh, since October 7th? Yeah. Um, one thing that Emily and I have talked about in the past is like, I feel like I'm very inclined to talk with folks or either like, you know, I'll engage with people online who are trying to like, you know, pro Israel or science, or people like us who are with it, but there's a lot of like neutral folks like in my life. Like, mm -hmm. I don't talk to my family about it as much as I should, but when I do, like, still listen, you know? So those people that you can get to, that you don't think to talk to. Like just discussing and how to deal with that sort. That's something I, I want to do more of because I've seen it go well for you know what I mean. Like I've seen positive conversations. I don't do it enough. So absolutely, um, we yeah, we definitely need to like be on the you know on the social front and like just in personal conversations, not being afraid to bring these things up. But uh, and that I think that's one part of a of a larger uh, movement. You know, in in actions that we can be doing. You know, because we're we're never going to, you know, uh, find the revolution that we want just by talking to people individually one at a time. Even though that is an important part of it. So, uh, so what are some other things that folks have uh, participated in? Yeah, Kayla. Uh, oh, also, I know I'm, I know some of you. I don't know everybody. So, if people want to introduce themselves when they uh, when they speak. That would be great. Okay. Um, I think the most impactful thing when I first like started seeing the, the things in Palestine was um there was like a ship I don't know where but there was like a ship full of like bombs and stuff going to Israel and there were protesters like holding onto the rail yeah. and they were saying like um you want to imagine what you would do during the Nazis like this is what you can do and they were holding it back 
And also there's an Instagram page called Pal Pal P A L underscore action, where it's like direct action, like for Palestine. So that's really empowering if you guys want to see like direct action. Anybody else? Oh, Can I share a nonsense uh, action that, well, we can't even call it an action, but I think it demonstrates something about how the future power work, which is like the university that I work at had an event soon after October 7th. Um, and I was a panelist, and then there were two pro Israel voices on this panel. Mm -hmm. And the way the university represented the event afterward was like how proud they were that everyone could sit down and do civil dialogue, which is really oh, upsetting for me. Oh, oh. Um, and the attempt to make it a question of dialogue, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and even, even folks who came up to me afterward and were like, oh, oh, you know. Listening to you talk, it feels like someone from the other side could say the same thing mm -hmm. easily. And I'm like, mm -hmm. this attempt to like turn this as both sides and dialogue and interface mm -hmm. bullshit. Um, I feel like it's really reached this like boiling point now where it doesn't hold anymore. It worked for a long time, like it worked for a lot of people post 9-11 to make it a question of interface dialogue or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's not working anymore. And there's like this, it's just a really interesting, I think, really interesting moment. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I've just had the opportunity to be kind of popping around the East Coast, um, Boston and Massachusetts, went to New York, DC. Um, and in each of those places, what I am the most taken aback with is how mass these mobilizations are. And I think that we would really, um, no matter the type of action, whether it's a direct action or we're shutting something down or it's a huge march, each one, there's more and more people coming out and more and more people who was their first action. And I think that that's what's really powerful in political moments like this is it is time to mass mobilize uh, with huge groups of people. Um, and that's, that's really moving the movement forward as well and making more and more people feel like it is safe to say that we're against genocide it's making more people feel like it is safe to be on the street and we will support each other in doing this and there's so much more opportunity for organization then yeah kayla yeah just to go off of what kayla was saying like there's so many actions happening not just in big cities but small towns now as mm -hmm. well and like just today, there was one outside of Philly in um, Lansdale, mm -hmm. which is like a suburb, pretty conservative, um, but it's being successful. Last week, our comrades joined um, community, Palestinian community members in Newtown, another very pro-Zionist, you know, uh, mm -hmm. town. They were like, there was a whole counter protest there, but you know, it was it was important to have those actions in like these small towns that you might not expect these types of mass mobilizations obviously but it's still important to have that presence and to say like we're not just gonna like let the status quo you know let the zionist uh culture stay and obviously but the other part is too that it's important to have the numbers mm -hmm. right it's not just that you can just show up with a few friends i mean obviously that's good too but like it's important to have a solid group of us otherwise the police you know, mm -hmm. we've seen at some of our smaller actions how easily the police will see, look at us as like, you know, a smaller group and just like push us and push us mm -hmm. and try to take the upper hand. And so it's really important to emphasize the power of numbers when we go out into the street mm -hmm. and keep each other safe as well. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm glad you brought up the point about uh, like police repression because that's something that we've been seeing increase uh, recently as well. I mean, even just, just yesterday in New York. There was the targeted arrest of uh, just over 10 activists, uh, pro protesters, organizers, leaders, uh, leaders. Yeah. yeah, our uh, our presidential candidate yeah. for, from the PSL, Claudia De La Cruz, was arrested yesterday in New York, and she's yeah. out now, you know? So I, I was there yesterday. Oh, in New York? In New York. And oh, wow. then we stayed for the jail support, which is a really interesting concept that, like, I don't know that Philly has maximized the potential for, and I'm excited to kind of bring that lessons learned from New York down into Philly with the jail support. And I actually have one footage when she got released mm -hmm. and, and that I recorded with my phone waiting there in the jail support. Um, and that's amazing if you've never done that before. Absolutely. Yeah. So the, the sorry, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say like the, the reason I bring this up is because like why why are the are the police going after uh 
you know, people's First Amendment rights to to gather to protest peacefully. Um, when sometimes the, sometimes it's allowed, and then sometimes they decide to ramp it up. And it, the the answer is intimidation. They they want to intimidate the movement out of existence. They want people to see these arrests happening. They want to see people getting beat up, brutalized, and think maybe it's not safe for me to go. Maybe I can just support from a distance. And that is their strategy in quelling these movements. When I don't know if anybody saw the video, the videos of, of those comrades getting released from jail, but they were not intimidated. Right. <laughs> they were more revved up, more energized than that. And so I think we all need to keep that energy when it, mm -hmm. when when we're thinking about these uh, these these movements and these uh, mobilizations and and intimidation and all of that. Yeah, guys. Yeah, I'd like to add a few points to this conversation because first, I feel like the police are escalating because our movement is escalating. Mm -hmm. I don't know if y'all saw, but those same comrades in New York, in coalition with a bunch of other organizations, shut down basically all the bridges to Manhattan, mm -hmm. like literally every way that you could get to one of the most important economic centers in this country was shut down mm -hmm. by pro-Palestine organizers. Mm -hmm. And that to me, first of all, I think it, it speaks to Kayla's point of why you need numbers. You can't accomplish a feat like that with four people, mm -hmm. right? Or a couple cars. And you can't accomplish a feat like that with people who are loosely affiliated. Even if we don't know each other and we're not best friends, there has to be a certain level of trust to bring folks out to accomplish a direct action like that. And so one thing that I'm just thinking about is like, you know, this the question that I'd like to pose as like a, you know, like a conversation starter of is protesting enough? You know, mm -hmm. is it enough to just protest, to just go to the action, to just, you know, show up? Or, you know, what I would argue is that. In addition to the protests and the actions, we need organizations where people can consistently build and relate and connect to this movement and get connected to other parts of the movement and, and create even larger actions than any one person or organization could accomplish alone. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I just wanted to add a few other things on that point, but yeah, this is what. Anybody else before we? Yeah, Joel. Yeah, uh, just speaking about question three, like what has been the impact of the demonstrations we've seen thus far? I think I think it'd be very one dimensional to look at all of these demonstrations and all these protests, and just because the state has not changed their policy, has not changed the policy with regard to Israel's genocide of Palestine, that it isn't doing it. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very simplistic way of looking at it. Just say, oh, protests don't matter, it's all, you know, whatever. It's kind of nihilistic. As a matter of fact, I would say, argue like the dialectical opposite of that reality is the fact that like, because they're not changing policies, they're creating the conditions for more people to get involved in this movement. Mm -hmm. They're creating the conditions for more connections to be made among people, among organizations. They're creating the conditions for the heat being turned up, mm -hmm. right? The stuff in Manhattan that we saw you know, a couple of weeks ago was a manifestation of those conditions. Stuff that yeah. we saw just this week with the Mavis car caravans that shut down Airports, yeah. you know, on the West Coast, these are strategic nerve centers of the functioning of this country, mm -hmm. right? And so all that's happening, and and also, you know, people say, oh, protests are just protests. I don't think people really understand exactly what goes into planning yeah. mass mobilization, but it is no right. joke. Yeah. And the fact that you know, if they, you know, all the logistics, all the preparations, mm -hmm. all the like solving for all these different variables. Oh well, what are the ops come? What is this? What are the what are the police going to do? All these strategies. It takes so much to organize these things. And the fact that they're increasing mm -hmm. in numbers means that you have all these people organizing protests. Mm -hmm. These skills that you're developing and organizing these things are skills that we are going to need for that fourth question, which right. is what we need to do to see a free Palestine which is not a revolution in this country. I know that's right. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Can I read a comment from the chat? Oh, please do. All right, so we have a comment from the chat about uh, the impact of protests. It says, protests have brought the total breakdown of the administration's assumption that people are not aware or do not care enough or support what the administration is doing because of our vote. They can't ignore us anymore. 
Like Angela Davis said, this is a litmus test of our humanity and our government is seeing that we want to take up the struggle. Mm -hmm. That's right. I oh, know that's right. Thanks, Jeremiah. Absolutely. Yeah, Caitlin. Just a quick thing on that specifically. It also, I think we're seeing a really huge turn of people understanding that like the Democrats also mm -hmm. do not support us. And that has created a huge shift. And this has been something that has been so undeniable. Bringing it to their doorstep has been so undeniable that it is your fault. And I like, I have some liberals in my family who are like, well, I heard at your march that you did that they're saying like genocide Joe. And I was like, that's right. That's right. We're rejecting it. Yeah. And, and, and you, and you know why. And like, and I think that that has really shifted, um, which like each thing is like getting a little closer each year, each struggle, each thing that's happening. But I do really think that this has been a major thing where it's realizing that it's not just like a two party system, one good one, like it's the same shit. And and none of them have our back. Right. Absolutely. I mean, I don't know the last time that there was national mobilization, two national mobilizations in the hundreds of thousands outside of the White House That's right. un under three months. Yeah. I mean, that is a message that I think speaks for itself. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, when you see things like Biden's approval rating right now, which I believe is lower Mm -hmm. Then Trump's was at his lowest point. Mm -hmm. That is why we stay in the streets. Yeah. And like Gabby was saying, that's the first part. That's where we meet. Mm -hmm. And this is the next step. Mm -hmm. And there are more steps to come. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, Andy? I yes, Yesterday, seeing Tony get arrested mm -hmm. and just the triumphant glow coming out of the police station and rejoining that crowd, cheering for her. I was like, this is also not setting us up for conditions for a third political party to get footing. Because to piggyback off of this, like we see how awful Democrats are, we see how awful Republicans are, but voting for a third party in every election was a question of how many votes do I want to take away versus give mm. at that point, regarding like how much do I want to set up this other person to win. But now I think that that third political party is going to just this is where it sinks its, its roots into the ground and starts to really grow as a full, a full big olive tree. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Uh, makes me think of the the centennial the centennial anniversary of of Lenin's death. Yes. Today, you know, like just didn't want didn't want to go by without bringing that up. You know? <laughs> that's right. That, yeah. That, that was a man who knew a thing or two about leading mass mobilization. Yeah, no, that's the right. Together. So that's right. Give another uh, little bit of food for thought there. <laughs> Any other thoughts? Yeah. Really Sorry, what's your name? Yo yo. Yo yo. I just really like the scale, seeing it from the big scale, like globally, and then on the small scale. Like, I like seeing all the companies, their numbers are going down. Mm -hmm. you, can't, you can't really push their propaganda the same way. Mm -hmm. And they'll go, like, you see stuff like uh, now, the Star Wars movie, all their money. Yeah. And then on the, and that's just on the global scale. Then on the smaller scale, we're going to Comcast, mm -hmm. every time Biden flies, and I just, it's really interesting seeing that scale of it. They really mess up the balance of new coalition. It's a different kind of coalition. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, not really. Do you have your Yeah, I was just going to say that, like, historically, we can see how much this, like, question of morale matters to the seats of power, mm -hmm. where, like, during the Vietnam War, I mean, they, the, the, the state was so shook by what was happening that they were like, we need to draw the Soviet Union into their own Vietnam, which they did in the founders time, right? The U.S. was like mm -hmm. so shook by mass mobilizations in the U.S. that they were like, we, we need our enemy to have that too. Mm -hmm. And that like the first Iraq war was presented as a way to solve the Vietnam syndrome. In other words, let's go win a war real quickly and show Americans that we can win wars and that they don't have to like take to the streets and stuff. And so mm -hmm. if history is any guide, it's that, that mass mobilizing really stresses out <laughs> like the bourgeois thing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like that. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Um, I do have one question that Kevin brought up on my mind is everything you said about the political atmosphere where it is now. 
how do we all make sure that, that you know smoothness and hygienic as some way for the checklist to get done, whatever you want to call it. So keys and masses, you know, and voters are maybe getting votes or just getting some mm -hmm. or a vote go away, you know, which needs to be done today. Do my best to call for ceasefire, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not really all on board with them, maybe, maybe not, but something to think about and how do we stop the message from being derailed and repeat the whole um, political presidential race in the next few months. So, mm -hmm. I think that's a great point because the last time we saw, you know, millions of people out in the streets was a few years ago in 2020. Mm -hmm. You know, we had, we had the George Floyd uprisings. People were were at a state of of uh, of of un of not accepting the the status quo and not accepting what what our our elected officials were presenting for us. And we all know how that ended, which was with the election of Joe Biden and the return of liberals back to brunch. <laughs> you know. So and then we'll see some sort of violence after. Yeah, and exactly. Yeah. A lot of oh, city media yeah. and everything. Oh yeah. And to DEI. Yeah. And team. Exactly. Right. We yeah, we emerge on so oh. anti-anti racism. Right. Absolutely. And so I think a good way to maybe close this out would, would just be a, a little bit of a discussion of like how do we learn <laughs> from the our our own history you know how do we learn from mass mass movements mass protest movements that we ourselves have been a part of and that have happened before we were even born and how do we take those lessons and apply them literally today because we are in the middle of one right now and how do we make sure that we seize this moment to the best of our Ability and to to optimize the results. Yeah. I think uh, my name's Natalie. By the way, it's fine. I think it was so evident in 2020, like you referred to, that when your efforts lag and slow down, it's just a domino effect. And I noticed that myself, like going to all those protests in 2020, but then all of a sudden it stopped. It stopped locally. It stopped, you know, in other East Coast cities, like all at once. And you could just feel how that affected the movement in general. When it dies down, it dies down. And so what I've noticed with this movement is that even though it has been three months, it feels like there's still an uptick in the effort to organize and to mobilize and how important that is. And like how, I guess, introducing new ways to organize and mobilize is important with like the, the traction, just keeping it going, not letting it lack. Absolutely, yeah. Um, we'll go Gabby and then Caitlin and then Celeste. Okay, one thing I'm thinking in regards to your question is the question of leadership because I feel like I feel like that is a, a core aspect to your question is how do we assess and evaluate the leaders that we choose um, and be, and hold them accountable for actually following through with what they do. So like our presidential candidate, Claudia and Karina, they have, they're organizing and running as a part of a party that, and they have been held accountable. They are disciplined to their comrades, to other comrades and to communities that they're organizing in, that they have been organizing in for years. And they'll say that on there. They have said it multiple times. Whereas the Democrats and Republicans, like they, they thrive off of feeding people lies and then getting into office and not doing anything that they said they were going to do. Mm -hmm. And so I really feel like it's just a matter of critical thinking at a certain point. It's like, well, if these people keep lying and saying they're going to do something and then getting into office and only being held accountable to their funders, mm -hmm. to lobbyists, to corporations, like that's their class positioning. That's what it means to be in a ruling class when you own everything and you make your policy decisions based off of how can I exploit more people? How can I secure more money, more whatever shares of the market, et cetera? Working people, you know, you can do your little acorns and your little like stocks or whatever, but it's a different relationship to power. It's a different relationship to those lobbyists, right? I gain nothing from the police budget growing. Like I literally gain nothing from that. It doesn't fix the streets, doesn't give me a job. It doesn't help my family, doesn't help me with healthcare. It doesn't help me do anything. For the police to have more money they are protecting property 
They're protecting the factories. They're protecting Jeff Bezos having a trillion dollars and not caring about anyone else. So I feel like we really do need to just be honest, A, about the Democrats and Republicans and what they've really done for us, which is nothing. Mm -hmm. And like, also be honest when we hold ourselves and each other accountable, right? Like, are you really outside? Are you really doing what you say you're going to do, right? That goes for Sherelle Parker. That goes for all these sort of city councilors in Philly, all these Black mayors, Eric Adams, Lori Lightfoot, like people who are in office who have done nothing for the Black community, have done nothing for their for working people. They are only there because they are have been cut a paycheck from somebody. Mm -hmm. So I feel like, yeah, that's honestly kind of, we're entering that phase of like, we have to kind of get into those principal debates with each other and like not let people slide for saying racist, sexist, or just like lying in whatever way. Like, you know, I think that a lot of people, I think are caping for Joe Biden right now. They're like, yeah, Joe Biden is going to beat Trump. And it's like, I'm not following Joe Biden into a fight against these taxes. Mm -hmm. Like Joe Biden is not going to save me from Trump. Joe Biden is not going to save my black ass from yeah. Trump. Like he's not, right? But like a fight that isn't, I'm not counting on Claudia, I'm building with Claudia, mm -hmm. right? In a mass movement with other people who are getting on the same page about this. So sorry for a long answer, but I think it's a very important question, and that's why I had to snap a little bit on that. But yeah. Your responsibility. I'm sorry for your point. But to your point, I think something that um, sometimes gets over, often overlooked, is that there's only been two strong parties of Republicans and Democrats, right? And so depending on who you decide not to go to, you could have the consequences of the party you don't want to contend with the power. If you were to say Trump, for example, right now we have. Uh, that semitism, you know, racism, sexism, et cetera, all of that the forefront. We as organizers here are doing what we do with the most Palestine uh, attention now going back to our home front, which is fighting those battles here in the United States and getting, you know, the eyes off of what's going on with things like that. Mm -hmm. Right? Not not intended by any means, right? We didn't choose to stop fighting and fight, but it's just, you know, we're also fighting inside, you know, take that out until we can look out elsewhere. So I think. You know, as we sit here and say, guys, on where we want to put our allegiance and power, you also have to think two or three steps ahead as to what could potentially happen when you choose or choose not to go to, right? And what those consequences can be. And right, when there is radicals coming back and say prevalence of each other in some sort of statement again, right? And what that means is people in our community are looking down at the folks that are supporting them, making sure they feel safe and seeing how we split our time and the resources and the industry. Not saying it can't be done, but it's not a question that we won't have to, you know. At some point, come to the realization where, you know, where is our our mind, our our energy, our mental power goes to. Um, so, I, you know, something to think about. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Hey, that actually sets me up perfectly. So, <laughs> um, I I think like for me in uh, joining CSL and why I wanted to join CSL is because they were the ones who were always out and they never did stop fighting and it was whether it was for police brutality, whether it's for um, like a, a stronger labor struggle, like whether it's for like understanding how this is all connected globally. It's like they, they are the ones because they're organized, organized enough to fight and struggle for all of the things and like they have, you know, a structure and a, and a complete understanding of how to maintain on all of the fronts without really like letting one push and pull or like okay we're gonna forget about Palestine and it's like however long it takes and however long the strategy takes to win and to continue to really build in those types of organizations because that is the only way to do it is to continue to have like new like people coming in and to continue to like politically develop people and to continue to uh, teach people how to be effective organizers and to do that. And like we we cannot do it if we aren't if we aren't doing it in an organized way. And I really think that joining an organization is like a last step of being held accountable, being like told this is what we need to work on, this is how we work on it, these are the skills that we need to develop, and to be in the communities talking to people and seeing what the prevalent struggles are there as well. So that that like for me is why it's just like after seeing years and years of the consistency of like why it was so important for me to take it to the next level to like become an organizer myself. 
preach. <laughs> uh, I, all right, yeah, we do have like one minute left, I think. So Celeste, if you wanted to, to... I mean, everything you say is so cool. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to like, repeat it, but I think I just want to take the accountability for myself and my journey. And I'm like, I'd be out there by myself. I'm on my island, you know, living my life, studying, learning about. I know that's not what it's told me, but mm -hmm. when she said it, and I heard it again. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like affirming yourself, being able to understand that capitalism has literally degraded you mm -hmm. and has eliminated your ability to have like a full self-esteem and bringing that not only as like, yeah, over there, that leader, they're awesome, but also are you going to just follow them or are you going to activate within your own body? What are we going to do to build you, every single person up so that they can make decisions based off of their own developed integrity. It's not about other externalizing that, thinking someone else is going to save you. Right. We live in like this white savior complex where it's like, yes, you do that skill so well. I'm so grateful you're here. And I'm going to learn it too. Right. And I want to teach someone else that skill too. Like there's, there's no need to sit out. And I think for me, like, I could keep going by myself in my house and like, oh, I'm a nerd. I'm learning all this stuff. But since I joined the PSL, it's like it has affirmed and aligned and amplified my journey. Mm -hmm. And that's because it takes all different kinds of people. Mm -hmm. And it's in that you appreciate yourself. Mm -hmm. When you witness other people fully aligned in their journey, you rise up too. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we're missing in this capitalist society mm -hmm. is being affirmed, amplified, and seen, heard, and embodied as human humans. We're cops. We're chasing the next person to tell us what to do. Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah, we do that, but also how can we develop a sense of a self-realization yeah. for people? You know, it's like you are important. Every person a part of this journey is important. No one over there is better than you. Right. We do it together. And that takes practice, that takes discomfort, it takes all the things that capitalism keeps, oh, it takes relationships. Mm -hmm. And it, they, it's not transactional, you can't buy in, mm -hmm. and you can't take, and you can't just be like, bye. It's like, you stay together. And I don't want to use like the toxic, we're a family, <laughs> but you know, we're a collective. Yeah. We're all here. We all drink water. We all take shit. We all eat. Yeah. This is the best, like, on a base level, we walk together. And how do we walk together, though, is that each person is seen and heard and, like, appreciated. But that comes through this. Every time I come into this space, I'm like, oh, my God, thank you. You know, it gives me hope. It regenerates, like, re-energizes me. And I just keep going, you know, and I'm like, I try to share this with all my friends, you know, it's like, I'm a little crazy, but yeah. like, just having that hope, because anger brought me here, but yes. I'm hope. Like, I'm angry as, you know, like, hope is what keeps me with the people, with myself, mm -hmm. with my land, with my struggle that I come from, like, it, it's like, we deserve to be seen without job titles, without money, without all these, like, weird capitalist ways to describe our value and really appreciate each other and our willingness to be here and speak up and like get involved and learn things that we don't know but we can feel like none of the shit i've learned is like oh man i didn't know that at all i'm like i'm pretty sure all these people everyone feels it they just need to be affirmed they need to be seen they need to be valued beyond the money beyond the title beyond like this frivolous nonsense. So I think when choosing who's next president, it's like we want people choosing that because they choose themselves, mm -hmm. not somebody over there, themselves. And that will be easier to distinguish and recognize if you know yourself and your principles and your values. So we want to give people the chance to be educated and empowered without having to buy in to institutions that lie to them. Mm -hmm. So that's why I love the PSL. Because mm -hmm. what they're doing, they need to be empowered. And that in itself moves forward, like beyond the tangible and like numbers. But yeah, we need more people. Come join us. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I think that's a great note to end on. I do want to say, if you enjoyed today's event, 
Uh, if you benefited from today's event at all, we have QR codes, we have tip jars, anything that you're able to uh, contribute. This place is completely, you know, grassroots. We don't take grants from the government. We don't, you know, we're donations and dues funded. So uh, if anybody does have anything that they're able to contribute, that would go a really long way to helping more events like this take place. Uh, we're going to wrap up for now, but please come up to any one of us. Uh, if you are a volunteer with the Liberation Center, raise your hand. Yeah, so talk to anybody uh, and, and uh, let's continue to build. Thanks, guys. Thank you.